afternoon. Thank you all for being here for our uh, COVID-19 Financial Oversight Committee meeting on October 29th. And uh, before we proceed with the agenda in front of you, um, I would ask for a motion to proceed electronically. I have a motion. I move that the proposed agenda constitutes essential business and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and well-being of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak and pandemic. And this is Sarah right. Finley, and I second that motion. Fantastic. Um, I need to do a roll call to take the vote to proceed. Let me grab my list. I think on the phone or on the meeting right currently, we have Sarah Finley. Here. Excellent. Uh, Councilmember Gamble. Here. All right. We're doing eyes for voting yes. Not, not, not roll call. Normally I say presence, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just for clarity. I present. Don here. Henry. Aye. Cool. Councilmember Johnston. Aye. And Councilmember Sepulveda. Aye. Thank you. That's it. We have five in favor, none against. That, oh, yeah. Junad's on. Sorry. Junad, we are voting to proceed electronically. See, still on mute. Um, and I also see that Representative Love, you've joined us. We are currently voting to proceed electronically. Do you have a vote? Aye. Hey, this is Janad. I vote aye. All right. And I'm back sorry. to Janad. Excellent. Nope, we got gotcha. you. All right, so we have seven present. There was seven to zero, no against in favor of proceeding. So we will jump into um, our agenda. The and, and I'm sorry, item. that's a yes, uh, sorry. Oh, thank you, Representative Love, there you are. Okay, um, so our first um, item is the second harvest report um, that I sent yesterday. You all have that update. Um, for um, our food distribution. Were there any questions, comments? Mary Jo, my only comment would be, um, you know, it, it certainly looks like um, they're underway in doing what we had intended to have done in terms of serving um, the populations that have been identified um, in the Equity Alliance report. I guess my only question would be to them is, uh, I, I assume they are on track to fully disperse the funds, but I think it would be helpful now that we're kind of close to November to just get confirmation that they don't see any time constraints and being able to put these monies to, to full use. Okay, I will forward that along. I, I did, um, when I sent out the um, uh, notice that all the contracts would be extended, I did hear back from Nancy that she was really pleased with that, particularly with the uptick in need for food around the holidays. So um, I, I don't want to put words in their mouth. I know that they were um, hoping to be able to have those funds during the holidays with food distribution. So um, I will get that confirmation that there isn't any issue um, with um, utilizing all funds by the 30th of Thank December. But I did take a look. I think the numbers do look really good um, as far as serving the areas that we were hoping um, to make sure that we're focused on seem to be. Okay, and the second, it's not on the agenda. Um, I apologize, but the other um, report back was from um, Pathway Lending. And specifically with the combination of the live music venues, as well as our small businesses. Um, and I think that that was um, not unexpected to see that the small businesses um, have almost completely been subscribed. And I think with what is in the queue, um, while the funding has not been distributed yet, um, they were waiting to see everything that's in the queue, you'll see the distributions we're gonna start, I think today and tomorrow, 
um, and that they've been fully subscribed. Mary Jo, this is Courtney Johnson. Um, so I wanted to see if the committee, um, so I kind of wanted to open a discussion as I was looking over the pathway lending report. Um, so allocation for live music was limited to two months um, in, for like an emergency type thing because we were expecting the state or um, whatever other funding would come um, for them or support would come, which I don't think has happened. And then by the same token, the small and micro business has almost depleted. Um, it looks like their applications and final approval plus the applications in review would actually be more than the two million that we allocated. So I wonder if it's something that we could discuss in um, extending the live music venue to four months um, since we've extended everything else. Um, and that still would not get them. It look even if you were to double what they've done, it doesn't look like um, applications submitted are, 474 even if we doubled that that's a million dollars um and we allocated two million so i'm wondering if we extend the time frame for which the live music venues can receive support and then maybe move some of that excess money down to the small and micro business allocation to um to further support those businesses i just want to see what what maybe the committee would um think about that yeah, and let me um, just add a little more context because I have talked to um, Clint Gwynn at Pathway Lending. Um, you can see the number is 14. Um, there were some, it was a little bit surprising that there weren't more venues that applied. Um, there were only um, two that were denied and it was because they did not meet the criteria of um, live music. One of them happened to be a comedy club. And so um, I did get a, an email asking um, why they were excluded. And, and I did explain the committee did not really, we didn't discuss it. We didn't specifically exclude comedy clubs. It just wasn't something that came onto our radar. Um, and he referred to comedy clubs and other independent theaters. So I, I will share that with the committee as I try to share everything that comes into my inbox. Um, to make sure that you are aware, I do not have a formal request um, or a proposal. It was merely a question. And then, um, as you also mentioned, the um, small business is fully subscribed. Um, and, um, and there are um, well over 200 that were in the queue. Um, not just on this report, it has um, applications and final approval and review, but there were also like 200, at least 200 more that the application had been started, but not completed. We don't know if the reason it wasn't completed is because they read further and saw that they didn't meet the criteria, or is it a case where they didn't have their financials ready yet, so they're now preparing their financials and they were going to go back to the application. We're just not really sure why the applications didn't actually get submitted, but they could have, there could still be more. So there is quite a bit more to come. So just wanted to add those two pieces of context also. Um, this is Courtney Johnston again. When you say 200, do you mean 200 individual applications or $200,000 worth of, of? 200 plus applications. Okay. Yep. I still think it's worth discussing um, extending. Uh, well, the other question I had was, so for the comedy club specifically, did they qualify for the small business or micro business um, allocation if we were to add to that? I don't know if they specifically do. I somewhat presume they do. I don't. I don't know what their total revenues are. So, uh, but embedded in the question was why did you exclude comedy clubs, and why if I have to qualify as a small business, am I capped at ten thousand when the live music venues were capped at a hundred thousand? So, I that's what leads me to believe. I suspect they probably fall under the small business. 
and could um, and, and could apply there. But then the question was, well, that's capped at 10. Music venues were capped at 100. Now you can see from the pathway lending report, there were not very many. Um, Clint said that there was one application um, in the live music venue that actually hit the maximum 100,000, one hit 80,000 ish approximately. And then um, most of them were in the 20 to 40,000 range, which you can see the average ended up being, I think, 33. Yeah, the average award on so they're so they're not, you know, they are some of the smaller ones that are applying, which is I think what we expected. Mm-hmm. So it does. I mean, I think to answer your question, the committee could definitely consider some reallocation of funds from perhaps the live music venue to go to the small businesses or to expand the definition of live music to perhaps other type of theater events where we know theaters are shut down. Um, I don't want to put words in the committee's mouth. I think the main goal was to make sure we didn't end up with bars and live music. Right. And I think it would be modified, you know, just the heading of the live music venues to live venues. The definition that we put in where predominantly most of the revenue comes from admission sales or ticket sales would protect against that. And I think if we did that, we'd still have money available to either move down, as you suggested, uh, Council Lady, or to add another month or two months to what they could have qualified for. Still the cap of the 100, but adding two more months, because I think we did this as an emergency, right? It was a short term, let's get it rolling, and then we'd revisit. Right, this is, yeah, exactly, because we were anticipating that there was gonna be specifically some state funding coming for those live music um, or live venues um, type things, so that we were just trying to get money out the door as fast as we could, so you're right. Uh, Representative Love, could I ask, um, uh, not to put you on the spot, but do you have an update from the state on any of the small business or tourism or, you know, there was a reason we thought we might get some additional funding um, for the live music venues. And I don't, I, as much as I've tried to pay attention, I don't think I've heard any has come that way. So maybe just an update from some of the state funding for us. Yeah, one of the unfortunate things that is happening uh, is much of what I feared is coming to pass. We got nonprofits who got their $150 million in grants, uh, the reimbursable grant that haven't gotten reimbursed yet. And the surge program is is up and running, uh, but I haven't heard word back from the success of that yet. So my hope was that if the nonprofit $150 million set aside was gonna be a fast reimbursement, then we could have some of our music venues who had formed the nonprofit to apply for that grant and be able to then help the organizations. But since I have people, like I said, who emailed me the other day to them, they haven't got reimbursed yet. And is the surge, the was that the additional funding for the um, small business? <clears throat> yes, that was the program that was designed specifically to help businesses that did not pay taxes in the previous year and maybe had to shut down early. And, and, and maybe didn't have all their records together, but could prove that they were opening or open and had a reduction in their revenues. Mary, Mary Jo, do we have an update from the federal government? I think Representative Cooper um, was looking at doing this exact same thing at the federal level. Do we know if that went anywhere? I have not heard anything, and I, we do have a couple um, folks that stay tuned into our federal level for us, and there has been no, no further discussions. Um, I, but I haven't heard anything specifically out of um, Representative Cooper's office. I would um, be happy to reach out. I have a contact there. Um, I get the sense that anything at the federal level is stalled. Um, 
until I'm going to guess January. Um, I don't even think it's going to be post election. I don't think we're going to hear anything in December. I think we're going to hear in January. I, I hope I'm wrong. Okay. So sorry, and I've been going in and out. Uh, so if I understand correctly, we have people in the queue to receive money that is the total amount that we allocated for small businesses. We have the total amount uh, that we allocated for the music venues already gone, correct? Not for the music venue. Okay. So the small business, the $2 million that was put in for the small business fund has been, um, uh, the, the payments haven't been made. So I'm just trying to be careful to not say it's depleted, but um, enough applications have been approved for an amount that will, you know, that will deplete the fund as soon as the payments are made. And there are still businesses that started an application and did not finish them. So I, I want to be careful to not say that they've been approved. They haven't submitted their application, so we don't know exactly why. Um, but I think there's certainly more need at the small business level. On the music venue, um, there have not been any new applications. Everything that was um, submitted has been reviewed. 14 were approved for a total of 474,000 and two were denied. And, and I, both were for not meeting the 50% um, concert ticket. And I, I just am familiar with one that happened to be the comedy club. I, I have to look back at if Clint gave me the notes on the other one, but um, so there is still um, over 1.5 million available in funding through the live music venue. Okay. So Councilwoman Johnston, I, I think you were asking to open that up. So the people that previously were awarded that those funds could apply for further funding. Is that correct? Yeah, to the to the extent that we have extended um, relief in every other allocation from November the 15th to December 30th or whatever the date was to, to allow for, for more support since the state funding did not come through for the live music venues like we had anticipated extend their timeline as well. But even with that extension of timeline, say you double what the what has already been awarded, we still have almost a million dollars left in that allocation. So in my opinion, we allocated too much to live music venues, and that money could be reallocated to the small and micro business to expand support there. Because obviously we've got a lot of people in the queue that I feel like that money needs to be utilized. I, I, I'm in agreement with Councilwoman Johnston that we should reallocate that money to the small businesses. Um, since we our, our burn rate seems to be um, really high. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, Mary Jo, I'm a little confused as to um, why we haven't awarded this money, why, why it hasn't hit their bank account yet. Um, I, I, I thought that um, that was happening uh, last time we met. Uh, Pathway, we've, we've the, the funds have been sent to Pathway. Pathway, from my understanding, when I talked to them on Monday and then they sent the report in um, yesterday that they were going to physically cut the checks to the small businesses today and tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, we've sent it and they are cutting the checks. It just, um, it's this week. Um, so what I'm hearing, and I just want to make sure that we understand, well, what, one clarification. The extension to the December 30th, it, we didn't tell the music venues particular months. It was just a maximum of two months. So we either need to, so what I hear are the discussions is, do we want to grant more than two months of operating expenses to the music venues? Do we want to increase that to three months? Do we want to increase it to four months? I hear that. I heard still keep the cap at 100 so that we don't have anybody getting more than that. Um, do we want to extend the criteria to other live venues, such as a comedy club or a theater? 
Uh, now, if it's a nonprofit theater, it should be covered under our arts organizations. Um, but want to be sure of that. And then also expand or reallocate a certain amount out of that live venue to um, fund to increase the small business fund. So those are the three things I, I hear on the table um, for discussion that we would expand the number of months available, expand the criteria um, beyond just music, and then maybe reallocate specifically a dollar amount out of that live venue to small businesses. Yeah, Mary Jo, this is uh, Sarah Finley, and um, I agree with Council Member Johnson's, um, you know, concept of, of increasing the benefit from the two to the four months for these venues. Um, and um, one thing, even though I, I feel like the comedy club, uh, you know, it seems uh, like a, you know, the wrong outcome for them to be denied as an entertainment venue. I'm a little concerned about how we would define who other than music venues would be covered because frankly, I don't feel this money should be used, for instance, for adult entertainment venues that are performance. We would have to define it in a way that I think made sure that we, um, you know, were, were cautious about how we phrase uh, any expansion. So that's one concern that I have if we're not cautious about that. And then I think, you know, I don't know how long Pathway Lending needs to process a new application for small business, but I think anything that gets reallocated, we probably need to check with them on the date by which they would need to know uh, when they had extra money, because I do think that the last thing we want to do is leave any, any money on the table. Yeah, I, I would think, um, and Edward, welcome. I see your hand up. I'm going to come to you next. I'm just going to ask a quick legal question. Um, Alex, I think we would um, just need to make a resolution to reallocate whatever the um, agreed upon dollar amount is from one fund to the other. That's correct. Okay, so that resolution could go through council. Um, and as far as Again, not to speak for Pathway, but knowing that they have so many already in the queue, um, I don't. I don't think the holdup is not at their end. The holdup is that the small businesses themselves have not hit submit. So, I think if the small businesses are aware that there is still funding left, and to encourage them to complete their application and hit submit, we will have a similar number. Um, and, I, and I believe the number that's already in the queue or um, that would, would be available to submit would fully utilize the, the million dollars. I don't think it's taking pathway um, a, a very long time to get through big numbers of applications. Um, Edward, did you have a question? Yes, Mary Jo, thank you, Edward Henley. Um, I have, I also share the same sentiment as those who spoke before me about expanding the, the, the funds or reallocating the funds, expanding the timeline as well as reallocating funds. But I have a question and it kind of aligns with what Sarah was mentioning. I do feel that we should spend a little bit of, of energy on defining exactly what we want, I guess, in terms of a live performance venue and what that, and what that means just so that we we give that level of guidance to the organizations that we're asking to distribute these funds. I hate to hear that there's a certain entity or entities that may have been turned down and you have everyone on this call kind of nodding and saying, yes, we felt they should have gotten funds. I just, I would like to avoid that in the future. Um, and I also want to ask the question if those that may have been denied and those that may now be newly accepted under these new terms are able to go and request funds for months that they were previously excluded. Um, I just, and I ask that just because I think it'd be, it's good, be good to know, but also that might um, bear a little bit of, of, of us considering our consideration on the amount of funds that we reallocate, right? If there are some organizations that may want to tap into these funds under the same um, guidelines that were previously there, um, and now they're able to, should we make sure there is enough funds for those groups to go in and, and request for the maybe two months or so that they were excluded? 
Yes, the, we the it the um, grant funds never said which specific months the um, organizations were receiving the the grant for. It was just stated that it had to be um, two months of their um, most recent operations because we were looking at what we were looking at keeping them essentially in business during shutdown. So it was kind of like their bare bones operating budget for two months. So uh, for somebody, if, if we decide that we want to, I'm just gonna throw this out there. If we say we want to expand the criteria to include some other venues, we want to make it three months instead of two months, and then we're gonna take a million dollars and you know transfer that to small business. It wouldn't be saying which three months or if we decide on four months. It wouldn't say it had to be, you know, which particular four months so they could go back. It's just that it could not be for anything past December 30th. So in this case, we might be saying it's for September, October, November, December. Um, or, but it could even be that it's for June, July, August, and September. I mean, it, it, it just has to fall within the March 1st to um, December 30th timeframe. I believe that because we um, approved the funds in September, we were looking at September, October, November, December. That those would be the available months. That answers my I question. Could, I just wanted to make sure that we. we I think yeah, I think that was your too. question: is could it go red yeah. show? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Gamble, did you have a question also? Uh. uh question and a comment. Actually, I, I just wanted to express support for Councilwoman Johnston's proposal motion to extend the uh, time of months that the live uh, performance venue uh, will receive support in order to open that up. I, I totally support the uh, idea to redirect some of that music venue funding to support more small businesses. I just got an email today from a small business owner of a, of a hair salon who is looking for support, wasn't aware of our uh, CARES funding support through Pathways, so of course I directed her there, uh, but people are still just now finding out about uh, support that's available, so that, that will go a long way with helping even more businesses like hair salons that are still not operating anywhere near uh, pre-COVID COVID capacity. Um, also, I guess my question is, when we're talking about the live performance venues and, and being careful who we open it up to, we also, uh, you know, don't want, I, I mean, I guess my question is, what kind of venues would we not want to support? Because uh, I think the idea is that most live venues, like comedy clubs, have live performance, performances, and they are not um, you know, operating at, at capacity or anywhere near uh, capacity because of the shutdown. And most live performance venues are in that same position. So when we say we aren't going to support a, a segment of them, what segment and why are we saying that we're not going to support them? Um, this is completely <laughs> I agree with that, but my worry with expanding beyond the um, live music venue, which we had very, very specific, is that when we expand and yet we want to control, I think we put ourselves in a position of creating more problems than we're actually solving. And, um, you know, we had a very specific reason for focusing on live music venues because we're music city and and that's part of the identity of of our city and um I, so i i just i'm gonna echo my the, the concern that council lady gamble and miss finley have said is that um i think we're really starting to get into some dangerous territory there and i think that hopefully um by allocate reallocating some of those funds back to the small business that we would take care of this one specific comedy club um because while while they are limited to ten thousand dollars versus the hundred thousand dollars it still has to be qualified by what their expenses are and so what would their expenses be 
would would four months of rent and, and what and whatever's part of that exceed the ten thousand dollars anyway um i just i'm hesitant to expand that um we, we did that for a reason um and so i would i would say that i think we're solving um, a lot of problems by expanding the time frame for live music and then reallocating money to small businesses to support them um, but expanding the definition of the live music venues or expanding um, who we're including, I think, um, is probably the wrong route. Mary Jo, one question I have about the comedy club. Some of the uh, restrictions also with the small businesses is one million or less. So I don't know if this club would fall outside of that, if they would be more in the $5 million range. Uh, so I don't know if you have any information on that. I don't. Unfortunately, I didn't really receive an official request or proposal or an ability to look up. Um, any any business you know um, data stats um, and, and I'd be happy to reach out to that individual because um, they had reached out to they, they copied me on an email to their council member um, and I'd be happy to reach out and find out the information or even from pathway if they can tell us well, those that were denied uh, because they weren't live uh, oh, you know what you're right if they yeah. if they no, you, if they met right. the they, other they, requirements they, they were one of the ones that. Yep. No, that's great. I can. Okay. If we could, this is Courtney Johnson. If we could possibly get that information, if we could shoot off an email to Pathways or call them so that we could have that information before the end of the meeting, Mary Jo, sorry to put you on like. <laughs> um, but because I think if we're going to do this, we're already, you know, at the very end of October. Um, I think if we're going to make this resolution to change these things, I, I would like to go ahead and get that done, um, drafted for possibly even, I mean, I hate to put Alex on, um, on the spot, but to possibly get this drafted to change this, um, you know, as quickly as possible, because it is taking, um, to Council Lady Sepulveda's um, point, it, it really is a little bit surprising that no money has gotten into the hands of these businesses quite yet. And so... I don't want to hold up the process any any longer than we than we have to. Can I ask what the second business was? Okay, sorry. Um, I can, I, I was sending the email, <laughs> so I was actually typing, um, I will, um, ask that question also. I, I can't remember. I, I don't recall. I just remember it was two. And then I heard from this one. So I knew they were one of them. Um, but I did just, um, request the, um, I, 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 rather than asking a specific question, I just said, would they qualify for the $1 million or under small business? That way I'm not asking for information I'm not entitled to, um, so we'll know we should be able to know that on um on the comedy club and i'll switch over right now and ask the question on who is the other company or the other um venue of sort also um is there any other you know discussion does somebody want to make a motion um well this is this is it I had, I had my hand up sorry about that this is this yeah. is it no, please I'm, jump in. I'm i guess maybe in line a little bit with, with what council member gamble said I, I know that the music venues have a special place in all of our hearts because of where we are but i feel like we've outlined a parameter for those venues that honestly seemingly it applies to at least maybe two other venues um, and I understand that those venues did not necessarily take the same steps of organizing and forming a form of a coalition to come to our to our committee. But I feel like it's something that we have a responsibility to recognize is that, you know, all business owners may not be as savvy and may not have that type of, um, I guess, you know, resources to do so. Um, and I understand that the music venue uh, groups in Nashville probably have a much more close knit network than maybe other extraneous venues that have different types of, of um, patrons 
but I feel like if we believe that those venues that generate revenue in that way are impacted so greatly and these other venues that share a similar type of revenue generation are impacted in the same way um, I think if they are being directed to a resource or a pool of funds that is much smaller than what they may be able to qualify for if they were to take this route I feel I personally have some anxiety about that because while ten thousand dollars may be enough to cover the minimal cost, then they could be able, they should be able to go to um, pathways just as the other live performance venues did and say, well, all you get is ten thousand dollars, right? I mean, I think the, the the formulaic way of calculating what they would receive um, would be the same. But if they, in essence, earn or have a situation where they would need or require more funding, um, they are then limited by not being able to pursue this avenue. And I think. We were we were reactive as a committee to the music groups coming to us, um, and I think now we've had at least one and maybe one other group that have found their way to us, although it may not be in a formal presentation, um, to express a need that they feel they can that they at least qualify or justify that ask. So I'm 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 hesitant to turn away other venues that have a very similar revenue generating structure as a live music venue when we already have a formulaic method of, of quantifying how they should be, um, how they should receive support. And so I feel like that might be something to, to think about if, if we feel they have a strong case, just like the music venues do, I don't think we should limit their ability to request support. All right, I don't see any other hands. Um, I mean, I think along those lines, I mean, the, the, as the question that was asked is, you know, perhaps who is it that we are trying, and I hate to use the word exclude, um, and I don't think that's our goal is to exclude anyone, but our intention is um, that when we first um, set the parameters for live music, because bars were open, even at a limited capacity, um, our requirement for the 50% of um, revenues be concert tickets, it was because we, we were trying to make sure that we were giving this to performance venues that could not be open, and we knew would not be open for a very long time. Um, so we put that criteria in. Is there, you know, I think now what we're saying is if it's another venue that will not be open, we would be um, open to considering them, but specifically the adult um, entertainment venues is not somebody that we want to be funding. Um, is there another group that you're thinking, well, I, I want it, I'm okay with the comedy club. Um, as Edward said, they seem to be in the same position as these as, as, a, as a music venue, but this is but our intention was not to go down a, another path. Is there any is there any thought to that that could help us um, in the criteria? I hear some conversation for saying let's not expand it it's a slope. I hear some saying, but if we can really um, tailor it, maybe we should. Um, this is Council Lady Johnston. I'm wondering if the comedy club, because I know, I don't want to name a name of a comedy club that I've been to, but I know that they have a food and beverage minimum when you go in. And so I'm wondering, since we had some sort of limitation on um, what their source of revenue is, uh, it, you know, ticket sales, this, that, and the other, that if their amount of food and beverage sale would knock them out of the requirements um, in the live music allocation anyway. Um, and I guess that's another um, question that Pathway would be able to um, to, to answer, um, just thinking, you know, what could be the problems as, it, because again, it's not about excluding anyone. And I understand, you know, for this, you know, a comedy club is a perfect example of, of this, um, but I, I just don't want to open a can of worms where we are specifically having to exclude th 
certain types of businesses just because we disagree with what that type of business is. I just don't want to, I just think that looks poorly um, on, on us to kind of pick and choose um, who we're, who we're going to support and who we're not and the reasons why. Um, that's, that's my only um, hesitancy towards expanding this at all. Um, but, you know, to Mr. Henley's point, I totally get it. I just, I, my anxiety goes of like, ooh, this, <laughs> we're going to get into some, um, some really testy waters there, I think. Yeah, this is Sarah Finley. I mean, I think we can continue to, you know, talk about this, but I feel like that, um, you know, until we get the feedback we need from Pathway, we, we might should move on to anything else we're going to cover and um, and then come back to this. Because frankly, if we find out that this entity that's identified itself um, doesn't qualify um, as council member Johnson, you know, suggested could be the case, um, I, I feel like that this becomes moot. And so um, we can maybe avoid some of these difficult discussions until we have all the facts. talking on mute. Um, um, all right, well then let's um, let's move on to the agenda. Um, and I have to apologize. Um, I did send out requests for some information that was requested at our last meeting. Um, and I did not hear back from any of the folks at Music Cares. Um, so um, and, and I don't know if it was an email issue. I got one bounced back. So I re-emailed a second person and that original um, re request um, so I don't, ha they are not joining us today. I don't have any updates on the request for uh, music cares. Um, we talked a little bit about, um, the, um, nonprofits, um, representative love was able to share, um, some of what I was going to, um, share with you in, in a request to know more about what was happening there, which, um, so as you recall, all the various sources of funding pull up the email I'm looking for. The, um, the first, I would say, kind of source of funding that was available for nonprofits uh, was through United Way. Um, United Way had um, really partnered with Metro and, um, but it was, it was private um, donations and corporate um, donations. It was really a fund that they were administering with, um, they were non-federal funds. Um, that was roughly $5 million and that was all paid out. Um, the first um, rounds were for services provided to individuals by these nonprofits. So that was about three and a half million, I believe, of the five million. The last million and a half was actually um, funding for the nonprofits themselves. So they could, any increased expenses because of COVID, um, any PPE, you know, like telework, um, you know, things that were impacting that nonprofit themselves, they could apply for grant funding. And so um, the state had the 150 million and for Middle Tennessee, um, there was four, uh, $43 million awarded. Um, and and as Representative Love said, it is a reimbursement basis. We don't have the final numbers on how much has been applied for in that reimbursement. Um, the state also extended that to December 4th. So it really be mid early to mid-December before we know if there are any funds left of that 43 million. as well as um, services to be provided for the community. Um, of those that, that 43 million, um, there were um, roughly half of the nonprofits that applied for the state funding did not receive it. So that was um, something that somebody had asked, you know, at our previous meeting, could we get an update? I think that was probably a, a, a key number um, that many of the nonprofits that applied for the state funds are not 
part of that $43 million. They were not, they were not deemed either approved or eligible. I, I, I don't want to be too concrete in the way I put that. Um, so that's the nonprofit update. And then um, any questions on that? Okay, I don't see any hands. Um, and then let me just go through our framework. I did send that all to you again um, with our most recent awards. Oh, I almost forgot our farmer's market resolution. Gosh, okay. That's what we need to do right now. Um, let's look at the framework real quick because that's all it's going to take. Um, I just want to point out where we're at. Well, I'm spending more time looking at for it, but here we go. Mary Jo, it's Jennifer Gamble. While you're looking that up, I, I do want to note that there is a resolution uh, coming before the council uh, next week that refers to uh, allocating $200,000 of CARES funding uh that was has already been allocated allocated that has already been designated through the community partnership fund grants that were approved that 2.8 million that was approved before the the committee even met uh, was approved by the council a uh, 200,000 of that is being uh there's a resolution for 200,000 of that to go to the office of, of family safety and I just I brought that I want to bring that to everyone's attention because it is not any new funding. I think there may be a mis some misunderstanding because at first I thought that it was some a new uh, funding request, but it is not new funding. It is a part of the 2.8 um, nonprofit funding that was allocated or directed earlier in the um, in the budget cycle. I think it was uh, may have been July. Or August before we met, and this two hundred thousand is coming out of that for the Office of Public uh, of Family Safety. Uh, so just wanted to mention that. Uh, no, I appreciate Council that. Oh, go ahead, somebody else. Yeah, Council Member uh, Gamble, this is Sarah Finley. Um, do you think that that two hundred thousand overlaps with the one hundred and forty-five thousand number that is on our chart? It, where are you looking? It, it this would come out of the nonprofit uh, CPF. I think that direct appropriation that two point eight. Yeah, there's a yes. separate line item a little bit further down from the nonprofit two point eight number that says additional community partnership funds, Office of Family Safety. So let me let me walk through that okay. Um, okay. if I may. So yeah, I had it on my list to make sure that I mentioned the community partnership um, grants. So um, looking at your framework, um, if you look under the supporting the health and ec economic welfare of individuals, that second line item is nonprofits not included in the FY21 budget for CPF, which is community partnership funds and direct appropriations. And that 2.8 million of the 2.8, 1 million is community partnership funds. And that is a program um, that's been in place actually for at least 10 years. It's gone through a few revisions. It used to be community enhancement funds um, for the last, I think this is the fourth year that um, it's been called community partnership funds. There are five departments that um, historically have received $200,000 each. It is the Office of uh, Family Safety social services, juvenile court, the public library, and the health department. And um, those five departments went through the same uh, application process that they have in the past with a very um, different direction. The only thing that was really different was that they had to be, they could make these awards to nonprofits that were serving individuals and families impacted by COVID. So um, on this week's uh, or next week's um, agenda for the council, they have already approved the allocation of $200,000 to each of those five departments. 
but they have to, the departments have to bring the specific contracts back to council now that they've actually selected the, the awardees. So um, in the case uh, this week, I believe it is um, juvenile court and um, office of family safety. What I can tell you about um, the contracts um, for office of family safety, there is a, a predominant um, service to domestic violence um, and child abuse. Um, so a lot of the funding is going um, for organizations because we've seen such an uptick um, in domestic violence. And, um, and sadly, uh, there's been a, 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 a bit of a decline in the reported child abuse. Um, because of schools not being in session and some of the other um, group activities that tend to um, bring out the report. So um, the um, is um, part of, and then with juvenile court, I can tell you a lot of those contracts are um, focused on a lot of the mental and behavioral health issues impacting um, juvenile, especially again, with being um, shut down from school not getting some of the resources and even just the socialization and, um, and and things that really support the behavior needed are not accessible. So a lot of work being done with mental and behavioral health for our juvenile um, youth at risk. So that's kind of the nature of what each of those departments do on an annual basis, even outside of COVID with those community partnership funds. And so, um, we will see those two on next week's agenda and the other three, I suspect, will come through in our second meeting in November um, for those contracts to be approved. So those are indeed um, separate from any of the other nonprofit funding that we've talked about, but they've been on our framework. They are just finally coming to fruition. The additional request from Office of Family Safety of that 145,000 is not included in that 200 when they were going through their applications is when they said, Hey, we really could use more funding. And so that's why they had made the request to this committee for the amount over 200,000. Um, but the 200,000, um, does. So it's separate, I guess is the, the cleanest way to say that. Um, does that, does anybody have any questions on the community partner of Jones and then and those, so that's community partnership is the 1 million. Then on the 1.8, the way it works with our budget is those organizations were all specifically named in the um, budget in the past. And so because they um, were identified in the past by name, they weren't in budget this year so that we could use our federal funding, but in the original, um, in the original allocation or approval of those funds, we knew who they were. For community partnership funds, we didn't know who they would be because they had to go through that process. So that's some additional funding that is being made to nonprofits um, for some of the work as, as we talk about the different funding for nonprofits. Um, any questions on those contracts? And you're right, um, Council um, Lady Gamble, you mentioned those were all the, the original approval of those funds was June 17th. It was the night, the morning <laughs> that the budget was approved. They were part of that. So it, it started on the 16th, it ended on the 17th. Yes, I, I remember that was my birthday. That was the 5 uh, a.m. meeting we had. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay. Um, I so I just, I just, I'm sorry, I just have a quick comment about it because um, I, when the agenda came out yesterday, I knew it. I know that it threw um, several council members off because the sponsors were listed as not any of the sponsors that are are any of the council members that are on the committee. So I would just ask that in the future, when that comes out, that an email go out to the entire committee with the option of the three council members to sign on to it, so that it doesn't look like someone is circumventing the committee and going straight to council because it really uh, it made me feel good that they were upset that we, that they thought we were being circumvented um and and i emailed you and said what is this and so um it just would have been helpful to have our you know that when they see our names on there i think it clears up a lot of um anxiety about it so just in the future if we could handle that thanks
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cause I did get um, another email, not even from somebody on the committee. So you're right. Um, our message has been well heard that the committee needs to be engaged. So that's a good thing. Um, and I will, since we have three more coming um, that will be similar to that, I will um, ask that our council members from this committee be added. I think that's a great idea. So the only other thing I was just point out on the, um, on the framework, you'll see where we added um, the Metro Arts Commission, um, those funding for the nonprofit art organizations and then farmers market. And I almost passed over that item on our agenda um, that you all, I sent the updated resolution for the farmers market. That was one at last week's meeting. There was a few things up in the air. And so we did not actually advance, we did not actually advance that resolution um, through the process to take to council. Um, I have given council office a heads up that we would still like to late file that, um, if, assuming we get through it today. So um, you all should have the farmer's market resolution. And, um, and I'll also backtrack on one other item because as we talk about the farmer's market, half a million dollars, um, there was a specific question asked if Pathway, because they are going to administer the nonprofit arts organization, um, we'll do that in conjunction with the eligibility requirements and recommendations of the arts commission but they are going to actually be the, um, the independent processor. Um, we had asked if they would reduce their fees, um, but then when the um, resolution came up to also be administered to, for them to administer the farmer's market, um, we asked, okay, well, if you just combine the two, will you only take the administrative fee out of, you know, the other amount because it had more, it comes out to 4%. So they, they did reduce it, but what we did was we left the 5% in the arts organization since they had 2 million and they are doing the, uh, you'll see in this resolution, there's no discussion of administrative fee because they're doing it essentially um, with the fee from the other one. And just because the funding was there rather than splitting up the two, the two resolutions, we did that. Um, so you have the, um, let me just review the farmer's market again. Um, our concern here was twofold. Um, we talked about this a little bit last week with um, the arts commission. If they were to disperse all of the funds, they would actually enter into contracts. And you've all been a little bit um, now um, um, the contracting process can take three, four weeks. Um, we try to get it a little bit faster, but um, given that they could have over 60 contracts with all of the different nonprofit arts organizations, um, it was much more efficient and a way to make sure that the um, nonprofit organizations could get their funds faster by using pathway lending. So we are doing that. Um, the same applied to farmer's market to ensure that um, in this case, there'll be about 150 vendors that will benefit from these funds. Um, we wanted to make sure that, again, for expediency, um, that we not have to actually enter into legal contracts with 150 vendors. Um, but the second piece that we also wanted to make sure is that um, ultimately we're helping these vendors retain their location with the farmer's market and we don't want it to be a revenue replacement for Metro. We really wanted it to be a rent relief for those vendors, but because of the farmer's market being um, a related entity, we needed to make sure we kept that arm's length transaction so that it wasn't just Metro um, being perceived as um, gaining you know, revenue replacement because revenue replacement is not an eligible expense. So um, that was, um, one of the other reasons to make sure that we partnered with pathway lending um you'll see as i said about the fees there's no fee out of here it's really a combined fee over the two um, resolutions um uh the farmer's market um miss canard will actually be doing quite a bit to assist with um identifying a bit of a matrix that says if you are a um a year round tenant versus a seasonal tenant. If you have a multi-year lease versus, you know, one time, 
and looking. So what essentially the, the rent relief will end up being um, roughly 25% of their rent during the um, time frame of um, March 1st through December 30th. So it will provide them a, a, approximately a 25% um, reduction in their rent. It will be anywhere from 1500 up to a maximum of 10,000 in, re, in rent relief. And um, again, administered by pathway. Um, and the other thing is that if any of the vendors applied for and received the small business grant of up to 10,000, then they would preclu be precluded from getting this in addition. Um, you know, I think there were, I think Ms. Kennard said there were uh, less than a handful that have already received in, in essence Metro um, small business relief. And we really wanted to make sure that again, more people could receive the relief than the same people receiving multiple awards from Metro. So that, that's the other piece of the eligibility. Any questions on the resolution before you? Uh, Council Member Johnston, I see a hand. Is that bold hand? Okay, <laughs> no problem. All right, I guess if we don't have any, and we can still have discussion, but if somebody would like to move this forward for approval. Uh, this is Councilwoman Sepulveda, I move for approval. Excellent, is there a second? Seconded. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion, any other questions? All right, I don't see any hands, so I will take a roll call. Um, vote, we are approving um, $500,000 uh, for rent relief for farmers market vendors based on all of the eligibility and criteria discussed. All right, Sarah Finley. Aye. Council Member Gamble. Aye. Edward Henley. Aye. Sean Henry. Aye. Council Member Johnston. Aye. Representative Love? Aye. Uh, Junata DeBecco? Abstain. That's right. We have one abstention. And Council Lady Sepulveda? Aye. Excellent. So we have seven in favor, one, zero against, and one abstention. Uh, Thank you all for Alex. Hey, Judge. I hear this two. Vonda McDaniel. Oh, you have joined I, us. I vote I aye. As well. Thank you, Vonda. And I apologize for missing you. I'm glad that you made it. All right. So that gives eight in favor, zero against, one abstention. Um, did some yeah, it, it was me. Uh, Alex, can I can I ask that all three council members be added onto uh, the resolutions? I think <laughs> somewhere in the process of the committee and the council office, uh, some of us end up getting forgotten or the council office sometimes puts a different council member on the resolution instead. Yeah, we, we fixed right. that on the one we just did. I'll make sure going forward that you three are all on them. Great, thank you. Okay. I apologize for skipping over that initially. Um, I think we've covered off the expenditure framework um, just so that you can all see the update of the 24.8 million is our um, remaining balance. Um, I, I did want to point out again, um, the reason I think that that reserve is so important as, as, we, um, as we know, the numbers are spiking. Um, we certainly are not going to have a magic end to this virus on December 30th. Um, and we don't have any real advancement from the federal government that there will be additional funds. Um, we, I do keep in touch with some of our folks that are really monitoring things happening at the federal level. And there just seems to be this idea that even post-election is not going to bring us an advancement because then we'll be in kind of that lame duck.
with our Hauser Center. Mary Jo, this is Ed. I just want you to know you're you're breaking up for, for me and I think a few others. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. You you were giving us probably some pertinent information, but I believe you need to repeat that as you were breaking up just a little bit. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. So I apologize if I repeat, if I go back too far. But I think the importance of having this reserve is because we're not going to see an end to the cost that Metro is going to incur for um, some of our really important um, steps that we are taking, specifically the labor that it takes for the testing sites and our homeless shelters, along with the cost of the lab invoices. I think we are going to see um, a spike in the um, testing and so that we will see our lab invoice expenses going up and I don't think those are going to end on December 30th. I think we're definitely looking through a full first quarter um, continued response. So that means all of our um, you know temporary labor and um, testing sites, the homeless shelters. Again, we will continue to submit as much of that to FEMA I don't want anybody to think that we are not utilizing every channel and every possibility, but um, but but FEMA has really been um, much more restrictive than we originally anticipated. And so while we are um, hopeful that maybe in January we hear of additional funding, I think it's really critical that we not put Metro in a position where the expenditures related to the pandemic have to come out of the general fund starting January. Um, we don't have that in our budget. This was one of our toughest budget years ever. Um, we are hopeful that um, the referendum will not go to ballot uh, for anybody that's been tracking. The, the trial was Monday and Tuesday. We will know on Thursday, um, November 3rd, a big day for many reasons. Um, we will know that answer. Um, I think whichever way it goes, we probably can expect an appeal. So I don't think we're really going to be out of the woods. And, and all that's to say, we just don't have the budget. Uh, we don't have any cushion in our existing FY21 budget to provide expenditures related to the pandemic. And if we don't get um, an extension um, or additional funding, we will need to um, have a strategy and we have one that's available to us and that is to utilize the funds that are remaining 24.8 million it is to utilize those funds in an eligible way which would be the the easiest thing to do is to use public health and safety salaries thereby freeing up what was in our general fund through December 30th so that we can create our own reserve. It, we essentially are creating, um, the city of Phoenix did this, they called it a financial stability reserve. It's creating a reserve that we then can put, you know, a two year time frame, a one year time frame, six months through the end of the year, whatever we decide is the, is the best time frame for us to then have those funds. What we've done is we have properly used all of our CRF by U.S. Treasury guidelines, and we then have funds that we have set aside in our own reserve that don't have the federal restrictions. And that we can use those to respond to the pandemic after December 30th. So I think that's the importance of, of that 24.8 million it, it's such a powerful tool for us going forward. And if it's gone, we don't have that tool available. Um, if in January, the federal government does award more funds, you know, then we have more funding for the community um, or for, you know, fill in the blank. Um, but I think, you know, just we've talked a little bit about the nonprofits. By no means do I think that they are all flush and doing great. I mean, it's quite the opposite. We know that. But I have also heard that many are rushing to spend by 1230, which means after December 30th, 
there won't be funds from the federal government for these nonprofits. And we know that families will still be hurting well into, you know, the new calendar year. So if we have those funds available and we don't need them all for test sites and shelters, um, they would give us the ability to still contribute to the community because we would be, we would have essentially unrestricted funds at that point. We wouldn't have the Mary, Mary Jo, can I, can I ask? Cause I, I know that NDHA received money as well. And I was wondering if some of their funds that they're using could be used to address, you know, staffing the shelters and all of that, because I, I am part of the homeless planning uh, commission as well. And, and so I, I, I don't know when our next meeting is, but I, I don't know if there's a possibility to have a more open communication with them and, and if there has been uh, with what, what those, what the results were. Yes, so um, there has been almost a million in emergency solution grant, which is ESG um, administered by um, MDHA. And there is also, well, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but I believe it's almost 8 million in CDBG. I might be wrong on that number, but at least 5 million in um, the community development block grants. And so that those funds and much of that is um, aimed at homelessness. Now, specifically with the CDBG, they went on record as being the funding of last resort. So because this kind of goes all back to that optimization of funds and I'll, when, when it pertains to most of our sheltering operations, the three sources of funding are the CRF that, that this committee is so involved in, FEMA and the CDBG funds and ESG. But CDBG specifically said, we are last resort. So if you can cover it with your CRF, you have to use that. So until that's gone, um, we, um, CDBG won't cover it. Then they want us to apply everything to FEMA. We'll actually do FEMA first, then CRF, then we'll go to CDBG. So yes, a lot of our sheltering operations were the, the most, um, uh, not obvious, but the, the expense, one of our larger expenses will be the temporary labor at the shelters. We do believe that can be covered by FEMA. So um, again, we are trying to get to those, filing those claims as fast as we can. Um, it's just that we have the tornado and we're still working on that. And it has a time frame. Um, that we have to work within. So, and then we also have the derecho in May. Now, I will say that's a much smaller event for Metro, but we are working with the three federal disasters. And so we are filing claims for all three events um, and, and trying to make sure we're keeping the right priority. But okay. the HUD funds are being considered for not only the sheltering operations, but also really importantly, rapid rehousing. Got it. Uh, I, I, I have two things. Um, one, I, I, I don't think we heard back from the state comptroller as to the results of the review. I know you said they were good, but I don't remember seeing um, any press release about that. So I, I don't know if you have an update on that. And then the second thing was that Council Ben Hall uh, sent a request for $5 million for the Porto uh, Hospital. Um, to uh, the three council members and to your office. And so I was wondering if that could be shared with the rest of the committee, um, just because we, 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 we did push uh, to make sure that, uh, and, and we appreciate Councilman Hall going through the process. So I wanna make sure that we stick to our word that uh, the committee would at least be able to look at this, not saying that we award it, mm -hmm. but as long as we could at least discuss it uh, I, I think um, that way, um, you know, we're 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 keeping with our word, and council members know that if they do request something, the committee will at least uh, take a look at it. Yes, thank you for for bringing that up. Um, I'll, I'll address the first question, which was the comptroller's report. And you're right, and and thank you for bringing that up. Um, they did come visit us and tell us they sh they they 
let us see the report. We weren't allowed to keep a copy because they still needed to go through the formal um, internal process. Um, I did hear back from them later that said, hey, I know we told you we were gonna release this on Monday and it's now Thursday and we haven't yet. Um, there were no findings. I, I believe that has been shared at the state level. I apologize if I am getting in front of anything. I just don't wanna leave this committee hanging. There were no findings. The official report, I don't know that it has been released officially, um, but there won't be any surprises. Just like I said, good things. Um, for the Bordeaux um, resolution that was presented, um, their um, council member hall um, requested five million dollars of the crf for funding for the bordeaux long-term care facility and that request was sent um, for finance to approve um, the availability of funds and director crumbo did reply back that because the funds need to actually be expensed by December 30th, not just allocated. There seemed to be a little bit of a confusion that as long as we allocated by December 30th, um, that this committee knows as much as we've talked about it, that the funds actually need to be expensed by December 30th. And because of that, um, he could not certify or you know approve availability of the $5 million in funds. So um, I'm glad that you brought that up, um, Councilwoman, because it's important for this committee to know that was why we didn't actually present the, the resolution to the committee itself, simply because um, the expenditures were for um, January and forward. Now I would also share, and, and this was part of um, Director Crumbo's response back to the council, if we get an extension beyond December 30th, what we would then need to do is go back and assess the eligibility of the nature of those expenditures. Um, nowhere in the guidelines does it say you can operate, you know, transfer all of your expenses of the operation of, of a long-term care facility. There certainly would be some portion, I think, we could make the argument that um, some of the COVID-specific care but certainly not 100% of the operations. So um, we didn't dig any deeper at this point on eligibility. We would certainly look for that guidance when um, and if there is an extension um, of the December 30th date. But if there is not an extension on that date, there wasn't any reason to dig any further into the eligibility of using these funds to operate a long-term care facility. Um, are there any other questions? At some point, I'm just a regular old citizen that had access. I would like a, I don't know if there's a point for a q and I'm not able to chat in the Q&A section, but at some point before the end of the meeting, I do have questions. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so for the committee, I recognize Luke's name because that was the email I got for the comedy club. Um, I really have to leave it for the committee um, to see if they have questions for you specifically. Um, so, and if you'll give me a moment, let me also check because I, I did hear back from Clint. Um, so let me check these emails. Mary Jo, this is Sean Henry. I was really looking for the emails and then we'll revisit you know, the initial $2 million for the music uh, venues. Uh, 
Is it, I mean, I'm for a question for the group. Should we further discuss reserving the $24.8 million um, in the manner in which you described? I'm, I'm more curious about other feedback. To me, it's probably the most responsible thing to do, um, at least with some type of time frame on it. And I, I really just want to hear other people's opinions. To me, it was common sense, but sometimes my common sense isn't everyone's, unfortunately. This is Council Lady Johnson. I, I, I tend to agree with that 100%. I'd, I'd made that motion before, and then um, obviously the nonprofits and things that we had discussed we wanted to do. Um, I think the the vast majority, if not all, of the other requests are not necessarily um, their their wish list items. Um, I mean, there's there's certainly things that if I had my choice that I would allocate to, but I also think that um, waiting. Um, especially if, if we have the ability to not, it's not like the funds go away. They they just, we're going to hold them over. They go into a different fund. And then depending on what the federal government does or does not do, then at that point we, you know, have have a, have a decisions to make in front of us based off of that. But um, first and foremost, I think we need to be prepared to handle the Metro response that's going to be required for this. And will will it take the whole 24 point whatever million dollars? I have no idea, um, but I would rather have more available to us than we need and then be, have excess where we can allocate after that to, to some of these items. Um, but uh, it, it makes me nervous that, um, because I know that, and I think everybody understands that our, our FY21 budget um, is tight, even with the, the tax increase, um, there is no room for that. Um, and so to be able to be prepared to handle, you know, testing or vaccine, whatever it is that we need to be able to, to handle, I think um, it's incumbent on us in order to be prepared in that way. So I, I would um, be in very much support of just take pausing um, allocations in, in, in order to put ourselves in the best um, scenario possible to take care of our um, most emergent need, uh, emergency needs. And not surprisingly, you summed that up much better than I first put it out. So thank you for that. It also allows us to continue to focus on the dollars we have allocated to make sure they're going where they need to. And if we need to adjust, as we may in a few minutes on the music venues, we will continue to do that. It just gives us one more lever of flexibility and make sure the money doesn't disappear on us. So I love it. I, I, this is Sarah Finley. I, I totally agree with, with, with both of you. There are a lot of balls in the air. Some of them may drop in the next few weeks and we may want to revisit this, but based on what we know now and with the um, surge in the pandemic itself, I think it's probably best to proceed with some caution. This is Councilwoman Gamble and I, I agree with you all. I, initially, I was really concerned about the nonprofit community, uh, which we addressed with the resolution for uh, arts nonprofits and also finding out about this uh, 1 million for the uh, community partnership fund that that will that those dollars will go to other nonprofits that don't fall within the arts community. I was very concerned about the Office of Family uh, Services, particularly when they came and talked to us about uh, the increase in domestic violence and the need for um, uh, resources for families uh, dealing dealing with that during the pandemic. And so now knowing that there are funds that have already been allocated that can serve that purpose makes me feel better about um, holding off on any more uh, any more allocations at this point and and waiting uh, in case we need it uh, down the line. So I agree with you all on that. Okay, so um, I don't want to completely leave that. Alex, is that, I know we talked about it last time. If you could just remind us, if we make a motion and pass a resolution to reserve the 24.8, I, I think you said we don't necessarily have to do that. Um, and of course, if we do, we can undo it. Could you just walk the committee through maybe the process of doing it or the impact of not doing that? Sure, uh, Alex Dickerson, Metro Legal. Um, we, the committee's actions in 
and putting forth some type of statement like that. You get, I mean, if you want to put it in a resolution, um, you can do that if you want to. But if you put it in a resolution, remember that it essentially kind of gives away your power to to reallocate those funds. So, it, but you could also vote just to reserve the funds without a resolution. Uh, the only problem with <clears throat> the only issue with that is that if you voted tomorrow to allocate more, some of those funds, it would then override the initial motion. So you got two options. One is you can send it to council through a resolution saying you want to reserve this. And then I think there's an argument that you have foregone your ability to do anything with those funds or option two, you just state by motion here without a resolution that you want to reserve it and you can always change your minds later. This is Ed Henley understanding that. I think one thing for me that I think is important and maybe it may be important for constituents of, of those who really care to watch the details of what we do as a committee. I think it would be good to think about a statement of what that actually means from a, from a practical standpoint of what this committee's role and responsibilities and what our objectives will be for the next couple of weeks. Um, primarily, if people are submitting proposals to us, if we are still going to review them um you know have we a stay of action or something that for, for those who have support have submitted a proposal um and we have not awarded i don't know if we have formally to this point issued any type of response to those proposals um if we formally decline them or say that they will not be funded i'm not certain of how that's how that's been happening um but i feel like if we are as a committee coalescing around you know looking at the remaining funds as a reserve that we don't really plan to touch unless there's an extenuating circumstance, I think it might be best to make that known, um, particularly to those organizations who have submitted proposals to us. Yeah, I, you know, without any other, I mean, anybody else feel free to weigh in. I, I do think that gives us the ability to let folks know that it's not that we are simply never going to allocate more funds. It is really waiting for some of these critical um, decisions um, that, that will come through, I think, through December. Um, and and it, we did extend the committee with a final resolution or final recommendation for December 15th. You know, if this committee, you know, believes that we should essentially create this $24.8 million reserve and maybe then meet again in January, meet, you know, every other week as we continue to find more information. Um, it is certainly not my intention um, to take any of the um, authority away from the committee from recommendations. Um, I think we made I think just the more information we have um, I know one of the things I'd like to give you are you know better estimates of what we think those expenses will be I've started to work with um, the departments to estimate what do we think we'll incur after uh, December 30th um, next meeting I'll be bringing you our October report um, of expenditures of what we're, of where we're really at as far as our actual numbers so our 48.8 million um, are we running over or under there? Um, there may be flexibility. So I, I do think a lot more information is going to be coming um, in the weeks to come. And it may actually have to be in, you know, well into December. Um, but I think then better decisions can be made when we really see how much is left of our rent relief. Do we use all 10 million by December 30th or do we roll some of that into this reserve and then we're able to provide rent relief, you know, in spring and, and maybe even into next summer um, when we just see how far this goes. I, I, I agree. Um, I think a press release would be um, what we should do. And I don't know if that would come out of um, your office, uh, Mary Jo, or, um, but if, if someone from the office could draft a statement that the committee could review, uh, that way we could send that out, that would be great. 
can the press release come from the committee itself instead of Metro Finance? No, you know? no, that, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the office created. Yeah, no, I was just paper. asking the question. Yeah, I think we're on the same page. Yeah. I think so. And Alex, I, I think the idea of the press release would be, uh, quote unquote, a formal statement um, of, of a very thoughtful decision making process, but then perhaps is not a resolution that boxes anybody in from a timely pivot as necessary. Yeah, this is Alex Dickerson, Metro Legal. That's usually what boards and commissions do in this kind of situation. So I think that would be appropriate. But since you're speaking as a group, it'll need to be voted on before it's put out. Okay. It, it, you said it will be. Yeah, she'll need to vote on it before it's released. Great. Okay, so we would, um, I will work on getting that drafted. And then um, next week, we could look at that as a group. Does that sound like a time frame works for everybody that then if that's approved, we would, we could release that after next week's meeting or Friday morning or whenever the media folks tell us our comms, our communication department tells us is the best time. Okay. All right. Um, I will work on that. Um, I did just as an update um, hear back from Pathway and the um, the suggestion was made to specifically to the comedy club to um, to apply as a small business. They did not. Um, they said to be determined. So. I guess there's just, we can get more information on that, um, on that particular um, situation um, as it comes up. I will, I will reach out um, uh, to Mr. Watson offline um, to, to get that feedback specifically. Um, I have other questions though, Mary, that, so uh, just to be clear, so I, as a citizen, I'm not able to participate in this meeting uh, whatsoever. This is a, a private, uh, closed door meeting closed off to the public. Is that what you're saying? Correct. It's available for viewing, but not participation. Okay. And I've got a meet. I have an interview with channel four. I just want to make sure I'm getting that correct. So there's no opportunity for any public feedback on this particular meeting. No, I gave you my phone number. So feel free to give me a call. Okay, is there anything um, that the committee wants to continue um, today? We're at 136. Did we want to go ahead and um, outside of if we're going to expand to other venues, do we want to go ahead and draft a resolution to extend um, from two months to three or four months and then also to reallocate a certain amount of that $2 million to small business so that we can get that money at the very least get that money into the hands of the small businesses that need it um, since that small business and micro business fund has been for the most part depleted. Is there any other thought from the committee? Reallocate some of the funds so that we can keep that pipeline going on small business. Yes, I agree. I, I think we should, if we can, go on and get that done today uh, to get on the agenda for next week. So I'd like to make a motion to extend from two months to four months for the live music venues, live live music venues, and to allocate. Um, we could talk about it. I would say anywhere from eight hundred to a million from the live music venues to the small business fund. and we can discuss that but um that's that's that would be my motion and i'm okay and I, just for some quick math because i think i heard us previously say we would still keep the hundred thousand dollar cap in place and since i know one has hit that and another one was at 80 that we could probably do the a full million dollars in a reallocation to small business because we won't double the awards already so that would still leave room if we were to um if we were to later come back and expand the criteria of a, of a live venue beyond music 
um, I think we would still have room in that original leaving a million dollars in there. I think we would still have some room. This is Sarah. Second that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry that. Uh, what one question is just whether or not we think that in terms of communication and awareness that we have captured the universe of live music venues that would apply because for some reason there was another communication about this with a new resolution and there were some that for some reason have missed this they could come in and we could have some some new applicants but i just don't know whether that's likely or not but i would hate for us to reallocate in a way that somebody that just didn't really understand the program um got carved out because we'd reallocated the funds already yeah, I think based on the um, average awards that we still would have room for new music venue applicants in addition to going from two months to four months of operating support, um, particularly if we chronologically do that before any other expansion of criteria. Uh, there are other venues, um, but it may be that they're um, capped at that five million. Uh, and, and, and just don't, I just don't have enough insight to that. But um, I do think, and, and um, I've specifically talked to the folks at Pathway that we were surprised more venues didn't apply and they've been in contact. Um, you all remember Chris Cobb um, came and presented and, and they have been working with him to make sure that specifically any of them in the Music Venue Alliance, but also just their other peers in the, in the network. Um, so I think we might see a few more, but I don't, there certainly has not been a lack of attention of knowing that that was available. Thank you, that's helpful. Okay, so what I hear is um, an amendment to our um, live music venue resolution that would extend the number of months of operating still with the same criteria of bare minimum excluding payroll from two months to four months, still with a cap of 100,000 and that we would reallocate $1 million from that fund to be transferred to the small business fund, um, both operated by um, Pathway Lending, thereby not really requiring um, any actual shifting of funds. This should just keep the, the pipeline of small business moving um, along with knowing that there's more funding for them to start reviewing more applications. I second that, and can we make sure there's no additional admin fee for that? Um, yeah, so there. For the yeah. extra million? No, that, yes, and, and that would be correct because there was the same admin fee on it, whether whichever fund it was in. So it was a percentage. So good point. I'm glad that you brought it up, but it wouldn't. It great. Wouldn't okay, great. I see what there. you mean. It's the same 2 million, but it's just shifted. Great. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. No, I'm glad you brought it up too. All right. So we had a motion made by council member Johnston, a second by council member Gamble. Are there any other questions or discussion? This is Alex Dickerson, Metro legal. Let me ask this question is, is it the will of the committee to have this filed as a late filed resolution for Tuesday's meeting? Yes, please. Okay. Then I would just ask that as part of the motion that you designate um, Mary Jo and I and one of your members to draft the language so that it doesn't have to come back for, for approval again. If it's okay with the other two council members, I'm happy to give you that authority. I don't know what if I have to make a motion for it or whatever, but just, just one of them. Of what? I'm sorry. Right. What do I need to do? <laughs> we just need uh, if you can just add your motion, Mary Jo, myself, and then one of the of the other members of the committee. Because we can't have two, because then it's an open meeting. So we just need one other committee member to bounce ideas off, and then this committee will have essentially given empowered us to draft the resolution without a, another signature, or another uh, vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. So to renew that motion and add to it that Mary Jo and Wiggins and Alex Dickerson and could it be me or sure. Kelsey, no, it can't be me. It has to be someone else. No, it can be you. Okay. Me um, to draft whatever it is that needs to be drafted to get this done. <laughs> it's a really official motion. <laughs> that sounds Perfect. really intelligent. <laughs> Second. All right, I heard a second. Any questions on that piece? Okay, 
So we're, I'm gonna take a roll call vote on an amendment to our live music venue resolution, which is going to, um, again, I'm gonna just say increase the number of months eligible from two months to four months, still with a cap of 100,000. Um, at the same time, we will reallocate 1 million from that fund to the small business fund and um, Alex Dickerson of Legal, Council Member Johnston, and myself will review the um, draft resolution to ensure it encompasses all of those items. And we will get that to Council um, by tomorrow at noon. <laughs> that is what we are voting on. Um, Sarah Finley. Aye. Council Member Gamble. Aye. Edward Henley. Oops, now you're on mute, Edward. Aye. There we go. Uh, Sean Henry. Aye. Council Member Johnston. Aye. Representative Love. Aye. Vonda McDaniel. Aye. Junad Odebeko. Did we lose Junad? He did have a 130 hard finish, so uh, we don't have his vote. And then Council Member Sepulveda. Aye. Great. So we have eight in favor, zero against, zero abstention. All right. We will get that drafted. And so we will make sure that the um, farmer's market um, resolution that we reviewed today, along with this amendment, um, uh, are on the November 5th um, council agenda. Are there any other questions or um, tasks? for today. Let me also ask, are there any um, specific items? Um, again, I will follow up with Music Cares. Um, I did not hear back from in, uh, social services. I know, um, I think Council Member Gamble, you had asked about some of the funeral costs. I will continue to follow up on that. We will have Metro's um, emergency response report next week. Um, what else? Is there anything else you all would like on the agenda for next week? Uh, this is Sarah Finley. Um, Mary Jo, I think it would be helpful if the various organizations that are doing the um, technical support for small businesses, if they would update their reports to give us uh, information. Yep, they're definitely on for next week. We will have the small business technical support and charity tracker from United Way. So on that charity track, will we be able to find out if the nonprofits that have gotten these sub grants from United Way have been uh, making these payments to people? Yes, everything that, so the um, dollars distributed per charity tracker are actually distributed by the partner agencies. So I, I can't remember what last week's number was. I think it was three point something million. That means that the three million had actually been distributed by the partner agencies. The reason I ask is I, I did get a call from a few uh, people in the community that some of the agencies were um, being a bit restrictive in the funds that they were supposed to be distributing to the people. Okay, um, I I'd love to hear more. So maybe offline do. You or, I mean, you can either tell me now or we could get more details and just do a check in to make sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm a follow up and get specific names of people and, and where they may have gone uh, so that we can find out who was doing this and, and what the reason was behind it. Yeah, definitely. Let's just get the full the full context. Okay. Any other um, agenda items? All right. Well, I believe then we have covered everything for today and look forward to next week. Um, I guess I'll put my two cents in. If you haven't yet, you want to early vote, do it today. Otherwise, get to the polls on the third and we'll have lots of information at our next meeting. Thank you all. Thank Take you. Care. Have a good weekend. Be safe. You too. Thanks. You too. This has been a service of the Metro National Network.
you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit